I'm Zoanne. I am the reference historian for the Montana Historical Society. And if you were here when I introduced that wonderful Natasha, I've been here 10 years. And it's been pretty great. I raised a family in Libby, then went off and got educated. And I've been very, very lucky. So there aren't a whole lot of jobs for history nerds in Montana. What can I say? So I have been. What we're going to do today is um, look at things available online without you having to fork over money. Ancestry, I don't know how many of you have been on Ancestry, but they cost money. And so do many other sites. But there are an astounding, wonderful number of free sites out there to do research. Now, I'm going to focus on genealogy, but quite honestly, these are going to work for any kind of research you want to do, right? And there are so few of us. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll just get to it. Let's keep it as informal as possible. And I love small groups. All right. I do want to thank um, Ancestry.com. We called them and told them what we were doing, and they sent us magnets. And the Ghost Art Gallery sent coupons. So why is genealogy so popular right now? Well, I will say I've had an aunt. I had an aunt who started genealogy in the 60s. And so the Stoltz side of the family is documented ad nauseum. We know everything there is to know. And I quite honestly like a mystery or two once in a while. But I'm sure some of you have seen those wonderful programs, uh, Finding Your Roots and, and whatnot. And those of us who do a lot of research just chuckle at those because they make it look so spontaneous. Now, a colleague managed to pull up some numbers. Are you ready? So finding your roots, right? Mr. Smith. Their 2016 season, they had 14 researchers and four genealogists on their staff, 10 episodes. So imagine the man hours it took. The other one, which is um, Who Do You Think You Are? For one season, they had 30 genealogists and 10 researchers for eight episodes. So I will tell you that one of my pet peeves is when someone comes up who just happens to be in the building and wants to know everything about their family. And they've allowed 10 minutes. <laughs> because they assume it's all right there. It's not. It's not all right there. It takes work. It takes a little bit of skill. And I'm not sure about the skill part. I probably threw that in because I'm so involved and I want you to think I'm skilled. I think more it just takes determination and a little sense of wonder. And I did have a wonderful patron compare research to those, um, what are they, uh, machines that you go like that? Slot machines. And she said that you get a reward just long enough, just often enough to keep those synopsis going <laughs> and, and to keep you addicted. And I hate to say it, but the more I'm into this, the more she is right. It does become a bit of an addiction. So again, if you have that sense of wonder and determination, you're going to do just fine. The first section on this. We're going to look at several free sites. One's Family Search, another is Death Records, and there's two sections, two places we'll go with that. Newspapers, what are available on newspapers, whether it's the Missoulian or the Billings Gazette, the BLM, which is Bureau of Land Management and General Land Office Records, and then the Montana Memory Project. So we'll start with Family Search. Now, Family Search is a wonderful, wonderful site. Oh. do not need to be writing this stuff down. Okay. Oh, I've got lots. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and cute. All right. Everybody got one? Okay. Family Search has been around 
quite a while, and it is sponsored by the LDS Church. And interestingly enough, they were the site we used to go to for Montana County marriage licenses. And before Montana or before Family Search, the only place you could find those marriage licenses was at the county courthouse or the microfilm that we did receive from the LDS Church when they did the initial work for this project. And we do have from 1864 until, for some counties it's into the 1970s, but mostly from 1864 through the 50s. We have them on microfilm, but like you really, boy, Family Search has got them. Okay, now. I, get, I did get distracted. Census information. How many have done research and had census pop up? Everybody. Okay. Then it sounds like on some levels I'm preaching to the choir, which is really nice for me. Where people come in, my experience is where people come into problems when they start searching and they're, they're just starting out as they start too narrow. Say you have a James, I just finished, James C. Adams. Is he under Jim? Does he use the C? Well, guess what? All of the above. And sometimes with the older records, you're going to come across abbreviations. Charles is often C-H-A-S. James, I, thank you, J-A. So there are lots of things going on there. And the best advice that I can think of right now, if you can't find James C. Edwards, then look for his wife, Vivian. Vivian's much more unusual than James. Okay, so just, just stretch your wings a lot. The nice thing about these census, to me it's like a snapshot of the family. And of course, you probably know that each census asks for a different set of information. You can always tell, I like to say, what the country is being paranoid about <laughs> by the information they want on the census. So how long have you been in the country? Do you speak English at home? Oh, you don't. I can just imagine. What was that? Oh, you don't. Okay. But um, at one point, of course, they wanted to know how many people had indoor plumbing. It's so, it's, it's just, it's fun. Then marriage licenses. Yes. Eighteen ninety. The only one. And I will say that's one of those urban myths. I have so many people call. Well, I'm looking for Fergus County information, and you know all of their stuff was lost in a fire. No, it wasn't. It's it's one of the most crazy things. This this myth that things have been certainly lots of things. But as far as census, 1890, and sadly, they had survived a fire. But in the 1930s, they had no concept of the fact that things could be saved and dried out and whatnot, and they were destroyed. The federal government destroyed them, and I'm sure they've heard about it. They did not. Good question. However, depending on what you're looking for, we have. We have our list. The earliest list for Montana is there's an 1864 poll list. People, men, going to the poll to vote whether they wanted us to become a territory or not. And so for early settlers, that's often where I go. That's where I start. So there's different things out there. If you have ancestors who are Native American, they were doing reservation census all the time, trying to figure out blood quota and, and whatnot. And so different, different experiences for different people. Good question. Good questions. Marriage licenses, they are on familysearch.org. What is wonderful about marriage licenses is that woman's name. You have to, most of them will have the bride's maiden name, and then they get a little more sophisticated and not only do they have the bride's maiden name, but they want the mother's maiden name. Bam! It is a gold mine for genealogy researchers. Okay. 
also on FamilySearch.org, there are death records for some counties. And death records, believe it or not, can be a, just a wonderful source or not so much. And as one colleague has determined, well, this <coughs> strangulation from rope by hanging, uh, not everybody was hung to death. Um, but this is Frank Little. Anybody not familiar with Frank Little? OK, oof, ah, mm, how do you talk about Frank Little? There's the best Montana history book called Fire and Brimstone by Michael Punk. And it talks about Butte going into 1917, 1918. And Butte was a hotbed of unrest. There were Irish there, so what do you expect? A lot of Irish <laughs> weren't there. <laughs> but Frank Little came in. He was from the IWW, International Workers of the World. He did, he gave a speech to a huge crowd and it upset the establishment and that night he was pulled out of his motel room, beaten within an inch of his life and then killed. So we do know how Mr. Little passed. And it's an amazing, really an amazing bit of Montana history. So there we go. Some death certificates will have next to nothing as far as history goes. Because what if we have a, a minor who had no family in the area and no one really knew him? So there's not going to be a lot of personal information, but hopefully you will have the cause of death. <coughs> now. Important to remember, Montana did not require until 1907 that births and deaths be recorded. History is what it is. However, there are ways of getting around that. Butte, for instance, Silverbow County, for instance, and some of the larger counties where they had established hospitals started recording births and deaths that were happening at the hospital before 1907. Sometimes you can just get lucky and stumble on a family member. Right? And you can use the skills that Natasha talked about the last hour to look for mention of family members. Okay? Again, FamilySearch.org. Montana State Death Index is available both on its own and on FamilySearch.org as well as Ancestry, but we're looking for free information, right? So here we have um, a more recent addition to the index, and then the original indexes are look like this. And on FamilySearch.org, you can often see things just show up like this these numbers. And believe it or not, depending on what decades you're looking at, these codes will help you narrow it down. Then, find a grave. Oh my gosh. And I've often wondered what, I've, I've met a couple people who spend their off time doing this, and they have a ball. And I thank heaven they do. So here is find a grave. This is Frank Little's grave. Now, I've been to his grave, and it's really interesting. There's always empty scotch bottles, and I mean, at respect. People have left tokens. It's fascinating. So we've got what probably appeared in the newspaper, as well as a newspaper insert. Huge. I just, for, the, for Mr. Adams, I was looking for his, him and his wife found their find a grave, and it had two or three generations back of relationship. And I just, it was pay dirt for a genealogist. Wonderful. All right, who? And then we're going to get into newspapers. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because I know Natasha's gone over this. But what I like to tell people because talk, referring back to those people that come up and have allowed 10 minutes to come up with 100 years of family history, 
And then when they are first sat in front of a newspaper microfilm and they say, you mean I have to go through every page? Yep. It's the closest we're ever going to get to a, mic to a time machine. Because after one issue, you know what the people in Plentywood are doing in their spare time. You know what are the social families because they're going to be in the little gossip snippets. You know what the clothes are. You know where people are buying their clothes. You know who recently bought brands. You know who has been in trouble with the law. Sometimes it's relatives. It is one of the biggest and most intimate ways, I think, to get familiar with your ancestors is to go through those local newspapers. It's a joy. So, here again, be persistent and creative. Nicknames, first names, married women. <sighs> For many of their years, married women just didn't have names of their own. Mrs. Dave White. We don't know if her name was Betty or Mildred or what. And then the, the MCs and the MACs can sometimes be a bit of a challenge. Again, if you can't find James Edwards, no, James Adams, look for Vivian. Chronicling America is one of the sites that we use. This is, as you already know, where the Montana Historical Society, as a result of several grants, has digitized some of our newspapers. Now, did uh, Natasha tell you what percentage of Montana newspapers are? Okay. So that, is, that requires a paradigm shift for most people because Google, which seems to have unlimited funding, has managed very successfully to convince people that everything is online. And so again, when people come in and say, what do you have on the Stoltz family? Well, how much time do you have? Well, 10 minutes. Just, just pull it. Nah. The only Stoltzes that are going to show up are those who have been in trouble with the law when you Google. It is what it is. But Chronicling America has, is from the Historical Society. There's the search engine. And again, you're just gonna you're gonna get wonderful newspaper articles. And then the Montana newspaper portal. And Natasha did Natasha talked about this, didn't she? So, and this is by and large Natasha's baby. Because of course the the historical society is not working in a vacuum. There are so many other places in Montana that are doing their best to get information out there. And Natasha has managed to make all of those additions under one cohesive, under one roof. And they are all wonderful, wonderful options for doing research. And then, as I mentioned earlier, just get on the Billings Gazette site or the Missoulian site. And they have obituaries, and some of them have archives that will go back several years. I think Natasha told me, I wrote it down, just a minute, just a minute here. She's been as far back as 2006 with some newspapers here in Montana. All right. Now, the Bureau of Land Management and General Land Office records, uh, and these often come as a surprise to people. How many have roots that go back to the homesteading era in Montana? Yeah, me too, me too. So you can get on to the Bureau of Land Management site, and it is one of the easiest sites to use. You, you click Montana, you can click county if you're sure. Put in the name of the ancestor, and push a button, and that ancestor's name is going to come up, and you're going to get an image of the land patent after they proved up. So Marie, your ancestors there in the flathead, had they proved up when yes, he was killed? Okay. Well, actually, I have a copy of the Nebraska homestead, not here in Montana. 
Okay. All right. And then they, this is, of course, the, uh, an image of the original document. All right. But you, they also then have a more electronic readable document that will give you a section, township, and range. And so let's say you've come from uh, Washington State and you heard that ancestors had attempted to homestead in Dawson County. Where, where's Dawson County, but where was the homestead? And one of the things I find most interesting about this information, especially then on the same site with the maps that you can find, is you're going to realize that if they were homesteading in Dawson County and they weren't on water, they were destined to fail. You're also going to know whether there was a, a group of family members who homesteaded together, and that happens a lot. So the information is, that you can get is almost endless. You, your imagination and the questions you ask are the only things that limit the information that's coming. And then the Montana Memory Project, right, the Livestock Brand. So the Montana Memory Project, I've given you the address. Brands are one of my favorite things. It's kind of weird, I know, but they're, and if you're not associated with the ranching and agricultural community, this is going to come as a surprise. But there are well over 40,000 brands recorded in Montana today. This number indicates that there were 73,959 receipts written by the brand office between 1912 and 1917. That's astounding. And I'm going to say, no computers. No computers. They, if, if you still have ranching in the family, we can use these records to go back to the first time the brand was in the family or to go back to the first time the brand was created. And often they're not the same people. Because let's say John Doe had a brand starting in 1890s, open range, and there was that switch then to homesteading, and a homesteader, your grandfather, a great-grandfather, bought the herd and wound up with that brand. So we're going to find a transfer. It, there's a myriad of reasons. There, one of the most interesting brand searches I've done was the circle, quarter circle, and it looks like a smiley face. But honest to gosh, there was a, a period of about three years, and I found out after doing research in a local history that these, there were four young men who hit Fergus, what was going to be Fergus County, and they lived together. And honest to gosh, it looked to me like they were playing poker when the snow was getting too thick because they were constantly shifting back and forth the ownership of these brands. It was really interesting. And only they know, of course, but I like to imagine that that's what they were doing. So here, one of the things that it is on the Montana Memory Project, it's a challenge, but call us if you need help or quite honestly, come up and we will pull the microfilm out. The only way to explain this is that in 1873, when our current system of brand records was established, they came up, our forefathers and mothers, came up with a system where we can take a brand from 1945 and we can trace it back through the decades. For instance, just, let's just look at 1921, Mr. Hartley. Okay, well, no, let's look here. So Mr. Hartley, it looks like this was the first time Mr. Hartley recorded this brand. Okay, so we're going to use the J R, is that a reverse R? Yes, it is. J reverse R, H connected. Whew. And just FYI, 
The only person who can actually tell you what that brand is is the person who has it recorded. They have kind of an eminent domain over that. So Mr. Hartley got this brand, Yellowstone County, 1917. And then every 10 years, with the ones, 1911, 1921, 31, 2011, 2021, we have to re-record. Otherwise, the brand office does not know which brands are still available and who's moved on. So Mr. Hartley, still in Yellowstone County, re-recorded, 1921. But guess what? This page, 7,646, and there's about 10 to 15 recordings on each brand. So imagine that. It was from this page. So the recording up there takes it a, a decade back. So that would probably be the 30s. We go back. And then this, we go from 21 to 1917. So there's a wonderful logic to it, but I gotta tell you, it's really hard to use that logic on the internet when you, there's a physicality that is um, easier for me to use when I've got those microfilm right in front of me instead of trying to figure out which file it's on in the internet. Does that make sense? But on the other hand, I have colleagues who would rather do it on the internet. They've got that system figured out, so it's pretty great. When you're on the internet with this, it's all site recognition. So my guess is JAS, there it is, name. J -A, this JAS is not gonna show up because this is obscured. However, Hartley is gonna show up. But then look at this, we've got James R, JR, and an abbreviation for James R, Hartley. But boy, that name Hartley shows up. And then the, that's Hutchins, excuse me. So when you deal with brands that are with any record that's dating back to 1873, chances are there are some things that just aren't coming across clear enough on the digital copy to show up with site recognition search. Does that make sense? Same with newspapers. Okay, prison records. Oh my gosh. I gotta tell you, th they are, again, they're so cool. And this is one of my favorite prisoners. This is Magnor Hansen. I got a call, quiet morning at my desk. A woman from the Midwest called. And she wanted to know if we had employment records for the Montana State Prison. And I said, well, ma'am, we don't. Oh, but you have to, because I just found my grandfather's name, Magnor Hansen, on a list. And I had to inform her, ma'am, if you found your grandfather's name on that list, he was not working for the Montana <laughs> State Prison System. And let me introduce you to Magnor Hansen. He and a cousin, Johnny Johnson, robbed the Medicine Lake Bank early one January morning. They got away with $3,000. In, I, I, they feature it in both the Medicine Lake newspaper as well as the Plentywood newspaper. Oh my gosh, amazing write-ups. But the people in the bank knew the boys. Magnor was just 21, Johnny Johnson was 16. And the, and the newspaper reports say, Rancher Johnson's son, Johnny, and I just think, teenage boy, oh my God. So the boys tie everybody up at the bank, all four or five people. They get out, they split that $3,000, and oh, that must have seemed like a lot of money. And it was. One heads east, one heads west. Well, I don't know if Magnor was on a slower horse, or the posse was just quicker, they catch up with Magnor, and he is literally shot off his horse. He is wounded in the right shoulder. And when you, after knowing that, when you look at him, he looks like he's a little gaunt, doesn't he? So he has recovered from his bullet wound. In March, he is in Deer Lodge. Johnny Johnson, on the other hand, disappears for a good share of time. 
and he winds up being extradited several months later from Wyoming. Now the moral of this story is that by 1920, Magnor is living in North Dakota and he is married to a school teacher and obviously didn't share with his grandkids that he had once done time in the Montana State Prison Record. Johnny Johnson is in a federal facility in California. So one decided to heck with this, I'm going good, and the other decided no. Now, Magnor was also released early Christmas Eve 1917 in a special federal program where they waived his sentence if he agreed to go overseas for First World War. And in his records, it talks about being wounded. And he did spend some time in a hospital in France. But when I first told his granddaughter over the phone, I, I read this description. And it says something about a bullet wound, right shoulder. She, there was a pause. She said, oh, he always told us he got that in the war. He had it before the war. And maybe... Maybe the Germans got him in the right shoulder. You know, maybe that's the place that just attracted bullets. I don't know. So what is fun about these is you've already heard me. So we've got information. We know what his crime was. We know the date of the crime. We know so they give us so many clues. And it took me back to the newspapers that were more clues. I could still be doing research on Magnor. I, I really could. It's just fascinating. And that's, of course, what good researchers do is just look for those clues. Where else can I look? Where else is there going to be information? And by the way, from 1910 through the 60s, our prison re there are the, there's listed the names of the prisoners. Before 1910, we have to get on to older records and microfilm them. Military enlistments, and this is where history gets really personal. We have three different sets of records or three categories coming out of the Adjutant General's office. One is from the National Guard to 1918, and that includes the Spanish-American War. Then we have World War I enlistment cards, and it tells you, as this does, uh, where, where they were sent. So this, this gentleman went to Camp Hood. He had an honorable discharge. But they can, they will give us clues as to what company, what division they were in, and whether they s did time, served overseas. And we have World War II. And the poignant part is that World War II, my mother's maiden name was Beekler. She comes from a family of 11 kids and eight of them were boys, and there were four boys in the South Pacific at the same time. And my Uncle Carl was killed. And so you have the Beekler boys all together, and then Uncle Carl is in with his brothers in that index box. And I, I think that's pretty, I don't know, I get, I get comfort out of that somehow. And uh, we, I've had people cry when we bring those boxes up. They find their father's card and whatnot. Again, history can get mighty personal. Mighty personal. And then the county histories. We've got not quite half of Montana's counties represented with histories. And for those of you who have been doing Montana research, you know that there's a different character if you're looking at the histories that, say, come out of Rosebud County or Custer County, those agricultural counties, as opposed to Mineral County, uh, Sanders County and Lincoln County, that are what I classify as more boom and bust counties. They're logging and mining. Different sense of, of community. And so if you pull Custer County or Sheridan County, then sometimes their, their county histories, they've, they're serious. And they, they can be, I can only carry one volume at a time to the front. Whereas Lincoln County, the history that is digitized for Lincoln County came out after 1918. And it was more of a promotional piece, but it has the city fathers listed, and it's got the important buildings and whatnot. So it's less history than promotional, but at the same time, it certainly is a wonderful glimpse of history. But they are, again, searched by site OCR, site recognition, on the internet. 
And the harsh part about that is, I'll bet you every week or so, we get a call, people asking, where can I get a hold of that book? So many of these are produced in the 1970s and 80s, and they're out of print. And so you do, you've just got to hope that if, if the county that your ancestors are from is not has not digitized their history yet, hope that it gets, gets online. Another interesting source is, again, if people in your background or the people you're interested in homesteaded in northeastern Montana and the eastern boundary there, Evelyn Cameron took thousands of pictures. And she kept a diary. And so we often know that on such and such a day, she took pictures of such and such a family, okay? And for those of you who know Roberta upstairs, Gebhardt, these are her ancestors. And we've often speculated about why the little girl is behind the screen door. What do you suppose she did to upset the apple cart? <laughs> Don't know. They all look so unhappy, it's hard to say. Also, if you have ancestors that have come from Custer County, and I'm just, this is just stuff that's favorite to me. There's so much out there. But there is a wonderful collection from Dola Wilson, and it's called the Range Rider Collection. Dola Wilson owned a restaurant in Miles City, and he noticed in the 30s and 40s, the old boys, the old cowboys, who were coming in for coffee and breakfast were dying. And so he began a wonderful routine of sitting down with these men and writing, doing an interview. Why did they come to the state? When did they come to the state? What outfits? And this, you know, they called their out, the outfits by their brand, the DH, the, uh, the Flying W. And so in that collection are his notes from the interviews and then he sent them across the street to the L.A. Huffman studio. It was still called the L.A. Huffman studio for their photographs. And for those people who find a, a family member there, that, to me, that's as good as, that's better than winning a slot machine. And there are several collections like that. There's another collection we don't hear much about, but it's, it's the the pioneers of Montana. And those folks, and I can't remember when they started, but they had certain criteria and people had to fill out a form talking about where they came from, where they left, kind of the trailhead on their trip to Montana, where they first arrived and when they first arrived. And we have those forms too. So very, very interesting. And you're if you have an ancestor, this is the same paper that he or she filled out. Now it's pretty cool. All right. No, I'm sorry, they're not. But they're, they're in the queue. Okay, now, as I said before, the Montana Historical Society is not the only facility that's doing a lot, as much as we can, to get things out there online. The Polk City Directory is for Flathead County are on the Montana Memory Project. What's great about that is the early ones through the teens and maybe the 20s includes Lincoln County. And a lot of those very <laughs> scarcely populated counties in the area. They were, they were, the Polk City directories were, made, were created to make money. And so they were out there trying to figure out a way to make money from, by creating these books. Yearbooks are online now. The Peggy letters out of Miles City were letters compiled by a group in Miles City and then sent to servicemen. They are wonderful. The history of Gardner, they're just all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things. Other resources, okay, as I said, there are county histories online, they're, the manuscript collections, that we're getting back to that Society of Montana Pioneers, is n they are not online. Oral histories can be interlibrary loaned. 
newspapers, county courthouse records. If you can't find it online, call the county courthouse. I've yet to, to and I'm sure they're out there, but it's interesting that I've yet, and I've talked to dozens of courthouse personnel through the last decade, I've never met a, gr a cranky one online, or excuse me, well, online or over the phone. Local history societies, local museums, or your library. So there's still, if you can't find things online, there's still so many options for us. Oops. All right. 